Welcome to episode 19 of Two Cents Tuesday. Last week, Thursday, during my review of the book, Fixing Broken Windows, I was reminded of a position that I've always held, and that is, we will never solve our violent crime problem in St. Lucia, and make no mistake about it, we have a very serious and scary violent crime problem in this country, if we continue to approach this problem in the piecemeal, disjointed, emotional, unscientific manner that we have employed for over two decades. Unfortunately, these last few days have served up another painful and tragic reminder of the failure of our approach to dealing with violent crime in this country. In fixing broken windows, we saw how a scientific, evidence-based, proactive approach to fighting crime yielded dividends. That approach is based on the premise that you should attend to the small problems before they explode into larger, more sinister challenges. The proverbial nipping the problem in the bud. It makes sense, doesn't it? However, for some reason, common sense does not appear to be so common these days. Governments have tried various things to deal with the violent crime problem in this country. We once had an amnesty program to take guns off our streets but that did not solve the problem. More guns simply replaced those that were removed or turned in. Then various governments have tried recruiting more police officers and requesting, demanding of the commissioner that there be more police boots on the streets. But effective as this may be, more police on the streets does not solve the problem because the police cannot be everywhere and we do not want the police to be everywhere anyway. At various times, governments have patted themselves on the back for installing more CCTV cameras, but more CCTV cameras will not solve the problem. We can't put cameras everywhere and we do not want cameras everywhere. There have been calls for another operation restore confidence type of response from the police, but another ORC will not solve the problem. Our police cannot be given unfettered shoot to kill directives without there being serious negative consequences. In the last 25 years, we have had five different prime ministers. And if my memory serves me correctly, six different ministers with responsibility for home affairs. Before that portfolio was surprisingly split by this current administration, with both the prime minister and the minister for home affairs presently sharing responsibility for the police. Clearly a different prime minister, a different home affairs minister, or a different party in government has not solved the violent crime problem in this country. To reverse the worrying levels of violent crime we continue to see in this country, we must embark on a serious, long-term, comprehensive, evidence-based approach to the problem. We need to understand that violent crime is something that is driven by many factors and it has its roots in many areas. And we must treat violent crime as a national crisis. If we want to reverse the unacceptably high levels of violent crime we are witnessing, then I want to propose the following actions. One, we should promote and support diversion programs to keep juveniles out of prison. Prison should not serve as a training ground, an apprenticeship for young offenders. Two, we must put more resources into early childhood development and parental skills training. The period between birth and five to seven years old is when a child develops many of its psychosocial skills. It has been shown that parental skills training and psychosocial stimulation in the early childhood period have a positive effect on school participation during the teen years. And the more boys and girls feel connected to school, the lower the probability of them engaging in risk-taking behavior, like using alcohol, taking drugs, and displaying violent tendencies. Three, we need to reform our education system so that academic ability is not the sole measure of success. Only one third of our children who go through the secondary school system currently meet the standard that we use to measure success. And that is passes in five subjects, including mathematics and English. 
yet we persist with this system year after year. Totally indifferent to the fact that by our own metrics, our own standards, the majority of our students are not achieving the benchmarks that we've set. These young people leave school without the skills or the certificates that society has dictated they need to succeed. What do you think will happen to some of them after they are repeatedly rejected in their efforts to find work? We should invest in four. We should invest in remediation programs at the primary school level so that more attention is given to those children who learn at different rates, are more easily distracted, or have difficulties adapting to the structured learning environment. Again, the intention is simple. It is to keep our children interested and engaged in school for as long as possible and to make the learning outcome positive for them, or at least as positive as it can be. Five, we have to make conflict resolution an essential part of the school curriculum from primary right through to fifth form in secondary school. We must teach our youth that they should never have to resort to violence to deal with a problem. Six, we need to remove the stigma that causes us to use the geography of the birthplace of a child to predetermine how that child will develop as an adult and also often how that child or that individual will be treated by society. Every child, regardless of the community where that child is born, should feel confident that their path to success will not be constrained in any way, and certainly not by ready woman. Seven, the media needs to stop giving violence and antisocial behavior, prominence and preeminence in media reports. There are many other newsworthy stories. There are young people who are making a name for themselves, some of them in spite of the very challenging circumstances they have to deal with. There are communities and organizations that are coming together to tackle problems. We have students who are excelling at home and abroad. We have members of the diaspora who are making us proud and doing great things out there. And we have athletes who are blazing a trail in their respective sports. The media needs to give them consistent coverage for a change so that our people have positive things to celebrate. Eight, we should ensure that Bordelais functions as the correctional facility for which it was intended. And we need to establish a program that will allow reformed offenders who have served their time to be assimilated back into society. For some offenders, Bordelais is the only place where they feel comfortable, where they feel at home. And going back is better than staying up. Nine, we must use data and evidence to identify where the problems with violence and antisocial behavior originate. What are some of the obvious causes? And we have to then use that data, that evidence to focus our interventions. 10, we need to identify the communities and the groups that are most vulnerable and at risk and provide them with the necessary consistent targeted support that they require. 11, we have to change the socialization of our young boys so that they learn to respect girls and women. That is the root of much of the domestic violence we see. The new Domestic Violence Act is good, it's very good, in that it will allow us to deal with the problem more effectively when it rears its ugly head. But our goal should be to remove the impulses, the feelings of entitlement and superiority that some men have toward women. 12, we need to improve community policing and the relationship between the police and the communities in which they serve. We must rebuild the trust between the police and the communities to the point where citizens see the police as allies, not adversaries. Also, the police must be empowered and given the resources to allow them to attend to the small problems, the broken windows, before they evolve into full-blown crises. 13, we must treat white collar crime and its perpetrators the same way we treat crime committed by working class and poor people. Justice and the rule of law must be blind to class, to power, and to influence. That is important if we want people to trust the system and the institutions that have been established to uphold law and order. 
And finally, 14, we must truly adopt a zero tolerance to violent crime. We now take comfort in numbers. It is like we have predetermined what is an acceptable number of homicides in a year. What is that number? After last year, did that number become 75? That's crazy. Every homicide is one killing too many. It represents a solution who has been robbed of their life and families and loved ones who have been deprived of the opportunity to enjoy the love and companionship of the homicide victim. As a society, we have become numb to homicides. Yes, we might be horrified at the most recent killing, but our outrage does not last unless we are directly related to the victim. We need to get to that place where we collectively decide that the senseless killing of another human being has no place whatsoever in our solution society. We must put a stop to this barbaric behavior. We need to treat violent crime as a very serious national crisis and agree on a long-term plan supported across the political divide, backed with significant resources and a firm commitment to see this plan through. That is the only way violent crime will abate and the only way that our country, all parts of it, will be saved. Thank you for viewing another episode of Two Cents Tuesday. Goodbye.